pô, eu tô feliz demais, tudo aquilo que eu sonhei, que eu venho sonhando, eu venho acreditando, vem dando certo. Mano, as coisas que eu escutava lá atrás, minha mãe sempre falou, nunca sonhei em ter um, um, um Fusquinha, sempre sonhei, sempre sonhei em ter uma Ferrari. In 2016, Charles Oliveira barely qualified as a blip on the radar. There's been some times throughout his career where he's letting up. Justin Gaethje has referred to Charles Oliveira as a quitter. And this was when he was fighting down at featherweight, and he held the post of an exciting gatekeeper. According to many, that was his ceiling. He was an entertaining fighter and a competent finisher, a world champion. Fat chance. Quando eu falo, não, não é reclamar, mas vê só. A gente morava no fundo da casa da minha avó. Um quarto, sala, cozinha, banheiro. Seis pessoas. Charles Oliveira is better than we've admitted he is. In 2022, Charles Oliveira is the best lightweight on planet Earth, bar none. At first, it was about his skills, as he was not well-rounded. Then Oliveira improved his striking, and the talk shifted to him not possessing enough heart and will. The same Charles is still there. Choices were made in that by him, and the choice to quit was made. In response, Du Bronx went on a tear in the most competitive division in the company. And here we are, just a few days removed from Oliveira etching his name as one of the all-time greats in the division. I know, hyperbole runs strongs in the business, but take a look at the resume of this guy. Better yet, just sit back and watch this video to the very end and let his opponents make the case for him as one of the greatest lightweights in the history of the UFC. Welcome to the fighting business. The third installment of the opponents before and after is here, and we have a juicy one on our hands. From being called a quitter to the absolute elite of the elite of the UFC's top fighters, sit back as we take a look at some of the more recent opponents of Charles Oliveira and exactly what they said before and after they fought the Brazilian machine. Before I continue on with the video, I do have to give a big thank you to the first ever sponsor on the TFB's channel. Huge shout out to the one and only Raid Shadow Legend. If you've been living under a rock, Raid Shadow Legend is one of the top RPG games out there, and they are celebrating their third anniversary this month. Raid is consistently improving and evolving. Just check out some of the amazing things that happened in the game during those last couple of years. An amazing addition to the game is the Doom Tower. This game mode introduced a whole world of new and terrifying bosses to slay. As a high level collection RPG, Raid started with hundreds of unique characters and bosses, but that did not stop them from adding more and more new champions. And if adding new characters wasn't enough, last year Raid added a whole new faction. And of course, no review can end without addressing the newest and biggest addition to Raid. I'm talking about the Hydra Clan boss. It's without a doubt the biggest, baddest and scariest boss to ever set foot in Teleria. This month, Raid's adding in a bunch of new content and events. We're talking new champions, new artifact sets, Plus, they've got a full month of special events and tournaments. This is the best time to get started. And if you're not playing Raid yet, hit the link in my description to get a huge special birthday package worth over $40. We're talking about three free champions all at once. Miss Record, Tiger Soul, Romero, plus 10 Magic, Force, and Spirit XP Brews. You can find all the rewards right at the top right of your screen. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep coming. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts worth over $25. Once you're in the game, after clicking on the links in my description, just enter promo code three years raid to get your hands on everything. Once again, a big thank you to Raid Shot Legend for supporting creators like myself. It truly helps a lot. And I'll see you all in the game. Let's get back to the video. The origin point of this incredible run was UFC Fight Night 170. And the very first opponent that stood in the way of Du Bronx was Kevin Lee. A very determined Kevin Lee at that. The Motown Phenom was always a very vocal personality. But this time around, Lee was more confident than ever before as he had scored a horrendous knockout over the undefeated prospect, Lesby. You know, a lot of people forgot. You know, they, they wrote me out of the top five and uh, I had to make sure I reminded them who, who's here and who's the real future of this division. Uh, there's nobody else at lightweight that you can really look at and say, this guy is gonna rule uh, for a long time. And uh, I feel like I gotta remind people that I'm that guy. Lee had been eyeing the very top fighters in the lightweight division and said that he needed some convincing before he signed on the dotted line, citing that Oliveira was a hot and cold fighter. I did have to take a little bit of convincing in order to take it, uh, just because Oliveira is, 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 is hot and cold. Lee would give his opponents some props, 
admitting that he was on a hot streak, but he felt that whatever Charles did, he could do better. Those things that he can do, I can do better. That there was no way Oliveira was ready for the kind of pressure that Lee brought into the octagon. Oliveira did not say too much, but he promised that the fight would end in a KO or submission. And come fight night, this prediction came true. This was the first UFC event behind closed doors as the pandemic was raging across the globe. But despite the stark difference in environment and preparation, Oliveira remained laser focused and pulled off a third round submission in an initially grueling fight. The second round was the turn of the tide and once Oliveira saw the exhaustion wear on his opponent, Du Bronx never let up. Honestly, the way that he is performing lately, I mean, the fact that he's number 13, I don't understand it. I mean, he looks world championship material. After the fight, Oliveira celebrated the biggest win of his career, but his opponent was distraught. In a post-fight interview, Kevin Lee said that he would be going away for a few years. It's all on me on this one, so yeah, it's gonna be maybe a few years or something. A little later on, in an interview with Ariel Hawani, Lee praised the rising contender and claimed that he made Charles Oliveira who he is today. And he was kind of right in some ways. This was where fight fans and pundits knew that this dude, a former featherweight, was a force to be reckoned with. Oliveira went on from fighting the Motown phenom to fighting El Kukui, and back then, this was one hell of a jump. Recent history has been terrible to Ferguson, but the former interim champion was one fight removed from Gaethje, and he was still regarded as the very elite the division had to offer. The beating at the hands of Gaethje was bad, but many were confident that El Kukui was going to make his way back to the top, as there was no stopping the cardio demon known as Tony Ferguson. Tony's the boogeyman. That nickname, El Kukui, that's a perfect nickname for that guy. That guy's terrifying. Ferguson had not lost an iota of confidence and saw his loss as a stepping stone. Win or lose, you bounce back, you dust yourself off, you get yourself back up. In typical Tony fashion, the former interim champion did not talk too much about his opponent and focused more on how he had taken care of problems in his own corner. The two were respectful of each other during the final face-off, and then the fight happened. Oliveira quickly established his dominance right from the opening bell, and Ferguson struggled to keep up, always just one step behind the Brazilian fighter. Even the grappling was a blowout in favor of Oliveira, but all credit to Ferguson for not tapping out to that grotesque arm bar. Despite a few close calls, the fight went to a decision, and Oliveira scored a victory over one of the most feared lightweights in recent memory. After the fight, the two sort of became friends. Although there was a bit of banter on part of Ferguson, Tony sent out a tweet taunting Oliveira for not being able to finish the fight and claiming that Oliveira was mentally broken in the first round, hence his sloppy groundwork. For something completely different, different move because he was mentally broken in the first round. However, these two came together at the UFC press conference and Ferguson gave his former opponent props for stepping up and taking the fight. You're a bitch. Hey. Every fucking person out here except for this guy right here that's sitting next to me. And hey, that's not true. I'm gonna be real, man. Tony. The two even shared a hug and Oliveira was seen hyping up Ferguson just minutes before the face-offs. Ferguson is not exactly too friendly, especially with his opponents, but you could see that Oliveira had earned his respect and the Brazilian fighter kept moving forward, finally landing a championship fight. After his dominant victory over Tony Ferguson, the former featherweight was granted a shot at the vacant lightweight title. Khabib had retired, and the title was up for grabs at UFC 262, and the man standing across from Oliveira was Iron Michael Chandler. Chandler was a standout in Bellator, and while he was slightly past his prime in 2021, his debut match against Dan Hooker immediately cemented his status as an entertaining fighter and a championship contender. The former Bellator champion was confident in his ground game, terming his skill set as anti jujitsu with a focus on position and power. Uh, it's more of a, it's more of an anti jujitsu than it is an actually re an actual wrestling offense. You're gonna feel my presence, you're gonna feel my pressure, and you're gonna feel my power. Chandler claimed that he was going to make Oliveira second guess himself in every exchange of the fight. I think I'm gonna thwart every attack. I think I'm gonna make him second guess himself in the, in every single exchange, whether we're on the feet or we're on the ground. In a separate interview with ESPN, Chandler did question whether Oliveira possessed enough grit to be an elite fighter, citing his fight with Paul Felder as an example. I also was alluding to the fact you look at the Paul Felder fight, he tapped due to strikes. Um, you look at um, numerous fights, he, he just kind of goes, if, if, he, if he can't impose him, his will on you, there comes a point where he just he looks at you and decides, okay, you've won this one, I'm, gonna, I'm done, I'm gonna go collect half a paycheck and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home. During the fight, Chandler managed to hang with the jujitsu wizard on the ground, 
even locking in a guillotine choke after a concussive blow early on. But Charles Oliveira survived a bad first round, and he did not show an ounce of hesitance even when he was close to being finished. Mere moments into the second round, Du Bronx landed a piston of a left hand and dropped Chandler. And upon sensing the finish, Oliveira piled on the pressure. The referee was forced to step in to call the fight and declare Oliveira as the new champion. Du Bronx ran around the cage in celebration and even leapt over and hugged his boss Dana White while fighting off the security that was trying to drag him back to the cage. The so-called gatekeeper of the featherweight division was now the champion in the lightweight division, or as Eddie Alvarez once called it, the big boy division. In the post-fight interview, Chandler called the new champion the best grappler on the planet. As he had stated before, he was confident in his own ground game to hang with the likes of Oliveira, but while he managed a stalemate on the canvas, he lost on the feet. Turns out I lost on the feet, not on the ground. More importantly, Chandler was now a believer and said that Charles demonstrated that he had the will to bounce back from adversity. Got dropped, got hurt, you know. Um, I mean, I was on top, top of him. Um, he definitely, he definitely got through some adversity tonight. Um, he, he showed tonight that he is, you know, tougher than a lot of us thought he was. So, hats off to him. After his second victory over Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier was becoming a big star in the lightweight division. The company wasted no time in booking Poirier in a championship against Oliveira, and the diamond emerged as a slight favorite in the eyes of many. Uh, and uh, I go for Poirier. I think they're both well-rounded. I think Poirier's got a, a little bit more of that, kind of that dog in him. Um, I think Poirier wins that fight. I think Poirier will win. I feel like Dustin Poirier, he just has that, he just has that grit that I wish Charles Oliveira had. Oliveira was a transitional champion, and Poirier was just too busy with his trilogy with McGregor to take part. The title match was set for UFC 269, and neither fighter had too much to say as both were very respectful of each other, acknowledging the long road they had to take to get to the point. Sure, man, I've been watching that guy a long time. We've both been in the same waters, 45, 55, for the last decade in the UFC. There's a list of guys that, when they won the belt, was really special to me, and he's on that list. You know, Bisbing's on that list. Robbie Lawler's on that list. Um, underdogs. Portier had dealt with the trash talk of McGregor merely months beforehand, and he had no intention of mouthing off to the champion. When asked about whether Oliveira was a quitter, Poirier stated that he was going to find out, but from what he had seen, Oliveira showed true grit during his fight with Michael Chandler, as he was hurt and knocked down, but rallied back to win the gold. I mean, if it's in there, we'll find out, but I can't bank on that, you know. Um, we'll see, he showed grit in his last fight against Chandler, you know, he got hurt, almost got finished, came back and knocked the guy out, so if that's, you know, your last fight is the one I go off of, and he showed championship grit. That is exactly what happened in this fight as well. Poirier scored a knockdown and landed a number of significant blows, but Oliveira stayed in the fight, attacking the body with kicks and knees until a takedown in the second round shifted the momentum as Oliveira got off a decent bit of ground and pound. In the third round, Poirier looked exhausted, and the champion used it to his advantage to get his way to the back of Poirier and finding his grip on a rear naked choke, leading Poirier to tap out. With that, Oliveira had defended the title for the first time, and he did so in style. Following the fight, Poirier was heartbroken, and understandably so, but he did praise the durability and the ground game of the champion. What, if anything, about Oliveira was surprised? Uh, his durability, you know, I landed some good clean shots on him. I thought that was going to get him away in the first round, but uh, he's a champ, And man. stated that he refrained from following him to the ground because his jujitsu was just next level. Yeah, I, I didn't want to, when I did hurt him, I didn't want to engage in the grappling. My, my plan going in was to keep him kickboxing, keep him uncomfortable, not engage at all. You know, I, I should have engaged and uh, threatened him with my jiu-jitsu as well. I just didn't want to play jiu-jitsu at all. It was like, I just put a block on that completely. As expected of Poirier, he broke his loss down without excuses and displayed true class, even in defeat. what I needed to say. I mean, I think he is a quitter. He's shown us, you know, five times at least in his career. Soon after his victory over Dustin Poirier, the UFC set a collision course for Oliveira, the most heavy-handed lightweight in the game, 
Justin I Gaethje. I think he likes that kind of fighting. Well, that's a thing too. Right? I think that's what he enjoys. He likes breaking people. The highlight had set himself apart from the rest of the contenders with a fight of the year against Michael Chandler, and he was the last doubter left on the planet. Charles Oliveira still has some quit. Deep down in him, not even deep. It's pretty shallow. Gaethje was not entirely convinced that Oliveira had the heart to remain I champion. I would love to fight Charles Oliveira because I will show you what I'm saying. He's a quitter. He reiterated this consistently, stating that he was going to test the will of the champion inside the octagon. The choices were made in that by him, and the choice to quit was made. And I'm going to give him that choice on Saturday night. I guarantee it. Meanwhile, Oliveira remained confident in his abilities and focused on his training. But then fight week came along, and it was a disaster for the champion. Long story short, Oliveira missed weight by half a pound, and according to the rules, upon the start of the fight, Oliveira was to be stripped of the title. You can imagine just how bitter they sound, but the champion was not deterred by the setback. me frustrar, vocês vão ver o Charles 10 vezes melhor. Eu tô pronto para isso. O campeão se chama Charles Oliveira. Não tem outro. If this, if you think that this is going to frustrate me, you're wrong. Uh, uh, the champion, the, the champion has a name. His name is Charles Oliveira, and I'm going to come out for him. In fact, Oliveira only got more intense, and while the crowd showered him with booze, Lou Bronx did not blink even once. Officially, the company did not recognize him as the champion, but Oliveira said time and time again that there was one champion, and his name was Charles Du Bronx Oliveira. During the fight, Oliveira rushed headfirst into the flames and brawled it out with the most heavy-handed lightweight. There were no technical steps up or a period of getting the distance and timing down. The champion out-brawled Justin Gaethje, and after a knockdown, Oliveira swarmed the challenger and strangled him effortlessly. This fight just happened. So there is not much to add here as Gaethje, aside from a congratulatory tweet, has yet to talk in detail. But after years of doubts and trash talk from the highlight reel himself towards Dubronce, this moment was a cold dose of reality for Justin, as all his prediction and critiques over the champion were completely wrong. My, my job will be to prove myself right when I step in with him. I quit. Justin once called Oliveira a quitter, but in the fight, there was one man who tapped out and decided to call it quits. Tá faltando alguma coisa aqui, não tá? O campeão se chama Charles Oliveira. O Charles do Bronx. Hey, hey, there's something missing here. The champion has a name, and it's Charles Oliveira from the Bronx. The victor, Charles Oliveira, merely echoed what he said during the pre-fight, and that is all that needs to be said. As I mentioned before, Gaethje was the loudest doubter of Oliveira, and after the performance at UFC 274, nobody sane is ever going to question the heart and will of Du Bronx. Dominating and making the best fighters in the world seem pretty average. When Khabib retired from the sport, many fans were convinced that the division was dead and buried, and no matter who ended up as the champion, there was no escaping the shadow of the undefeated lightweight. But then, Charles Oliveira came along and ushered in a new era. I mentioned this before, Oliveira as a champion works wonders, and this division thrives on the back of the dominant champion as not a single soul can doubt him or his place in the division. Oliveira stumbled once by half a pound, but other than that, the former featherweight has been flawless during his run to the top of the lightweight ranks. Put aside all the technicalities and the commission rules and the UFC policy and whatever else that stands in the way, the fact remains crystal clear. There's only one undisputed and uncontested lightweight champion of the world, and his name is Charles Oliveira. The road to the title glory starts from New Bronx, and given his recent tracks record, getting past him will take a miracle. Come vibe with me on the TFB Stalks where I discuss all hot topic news and debates in the world of combat sports, my biased takes and opinion, and a whole lot more. I hope to see you there. With that being said, my name is being called and it's time for me to get the hell up out of here. Thank you so much for spending a few minutes with me today. As always, I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> what I told y'all. What I told y'all. I called it, didn't I? I think I did. I think I did. Or I just said I wanted him to win, so now I called it. We're able to witness a story that is so enticing, that is so connecting.